So there, there were several, there, you know, we had holidays where, you know, even not running around from time to time, I never necessarily felt alone because I was surrounded by people. I had friends, I had folks that went to school, things like that. But I will tell you this, that there also have been holidays where I personally have felt alone, where that great Christmas that you expected to encounter didn't necessarily take place, and you felt desperate and alone. Maybe you've never been there, maybe you have, but I can assure you of this, even if you're there right now, there may come a time where you are there, and there are people around you that are feeling the exact same way, that they're feeling alone that need relationship. And this morning, we're going to take a look at a passage of Scripture where even uh, the birth of, of Jesus, God in the flesh, come to earth, where he and his parents are alone. And sometimes how what you have planned doesn't actually turn out like that. Sometimes that great plan you have doesn't work out. And, and sometimes God's plan doesn't look like the one you had planned, but ultimately if you understand what's taking place and you trust in the Lord, it can be the best plan. So this morning we're going to talk a little about what it means to be alone. So if you have your Bibles, uh, grab them and turn them to the book of Luke chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. The words will be on the screen behind me. But if you have a Bible, Luke chapter 2, we're actually going to read um, what we call the Christmas story. It's the account of the birth of Jesus. It's the most familiar, commonly read one during this time of season. And as I told them earlier, I, I always feel inadequate reading it because I, I went to school at Hannibal LaGrange and we had a professor by the name of Dr. Burt who always read this for us right before we left for Christmas break. And he had one of those voices that sounded wonderful and, and he would read it and I thought, man, and, and I'll tell you every year when he read it, I, it made me think about my Savior and Lord a little differently. And so this morning I can't promise you the amazing voice, um, but I can promise you the truth of scripture. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles or if you're looking up on the screen, let's read Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 together. Scripture says this, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all who went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, and he was to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. No room for Jesus in the inn. No room for the girl carrying Jesus or for her future husband in the inn. And during that holiday season, I can assure you, even though they were doing what they were supposed to do, they were going to be registered for the census, ultimately so they could pay taxes. This was the government's way of you filling out your W-2, right? This is this is what they were doing, and they were going to register, and they had it all planned out where they were going to go, and they knew that Mary was pregnant, but they didn't know the day, they didn't know the hour, and from the way that scripture presents it, I, I, I think it, it somewhat snuck up on them. I think they weren't exactly expecting it to happen at that time, but it tells us that when it came time to give birth to Jesus, that he wasn't born in a kingly hall, that he wasn't born in a magnificent hotel, but that there was no room for him in the inn. And I believe that Mary and Joseph, probably even in the midst of God's big old plan, felt a little alone. Christmas wasn't working out like they'd planned it. Now, we're going to look a little bit about what, what this is, about what this inn was. And, and I just want to let you know beforehand that there's lots of theories. There's lots of theories about what, where and what the inn was and how it all worked out. And this morning, as I communicate to you, this to you, please hear me say this. What you're about to hear is the, thus saith Cole, not thus saith the Lord, all right? Um, I, I'm going to share a little bit of Greek with you so you have the understanding of, of what it is. And then we're going to use our imaginations together. And in me saying this, it does not in any way, shape, or form um, communicate that I was there and I know what happened. Because I can assure you I was not, even though 
And driving to your church this morning, I looked in the rearview mirror and saw several silver hairs poking out of my beard, which means I will be clean shaven tomorrow. So I want to show you here in Luke chapter 2 um, what's going on when they use the word in. When, the, when the, the word in is used, the Greek word that is used here is the word kataluma, K-A-T-A-L-U-M-A. And kataluma is a word um, that is literally, literally defined as, as guest room. So when we use the word in, um, in Scripture, it's, it's communicated two ways. One is this kataluma, guest room. The second way is, is, is pandochion. And pandochion is the word that is used in Luke chapter 10 in the parable of the Good Samaritan when it says that he brought, um, he brought the man in after he was beaten up on the roadside and he brought him to an inn and he told the innkeeper that he would pay for his stay and even come back. The word inn there is a pandochion. That is not the word that is used in Luke chapter 2. It's kataluma. And they mean two entirely different things. Pandochion, meaning a, a, a formal inn, a place of lodging for guests that, that you might pay for. Cataluma, meaning guest room. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, uh, th- there's several reasons why it could be important, but I have to explain to you a little bit of Jewish culture. Um, during this time, remember, there was no central heating and air. And one of the, the main things that you wanted to be sure of is that you could keep your house warm during the winter. There also were not uh, many supermarkets, okay? There, there, there was the market, but it's not like you could just run down and grab whatever you needed. So most families were agricultural in, in, in origin, and they also raised, um, they raised a lot of cattle and, and sheep, things like that, whatever. And, and so they had all these, these barnyard animals, livestock, if you will. And um, during the winter months especially, one of the things that they would do at night is that they would um, want to get these animals inside, um, number one, to keep them away from predators, but number two, because remember, they didn't have central heating and air and, and they could light a fire, but that's smoky and things like that. But you want to know what lots of livestock put off? Heat, BTUs. And so the way that most homes would have been designed then, if you were in that setting, was you would have your main uh, family area. Normally it was one big room. That was it. It wasn't like each kid had their own bedroom and you had um, the formal dining room. And you just didn't have that. It was, it was a room everyone was real close, you know what I'm saying? And uh, then there would be a partition wall made of some type, sometimes of animal skin, sometimes of of something else, uh, maybe just wood sticks, clay, whatever. And and they would build this wall. And then on the other side of it, they would, they would call this the the cataluma. And and this was the guest room. The guest room was normally used to bring the animals in out of the cold in the winter. And they would come inside and they would be away from predators and the heat given off the animals would warm the family. That normally happened in one or two ways, either through the partition wall or like on Little House in the Prairie, if you watched that as a kid or you've seen reruns or you're just really old, one one or the other. Um, I didn't mean that in the wrong way. I'm really old, I saw it live. And uh, they, if you remember, at one point the Ingalls had a house that um, uh, is kind of like a barn setting, big room downstairs, and I think they had a couple more rooms, but there was the big room down, um, there was the big open area downstairs, and then upstairs, it was kind of a loft area, and they had um, sleeping quarters up there, and they, in the cold, would bring the animals in, and the animals, the heat would rise and and heat the the building. The reason this is so important is this, Um, I don't believe Mary and Joseph went and knocked on the door to the hotel, and they said there's no room for them at the inn. Uh, There's theories that say that they did. I I don't believe the Greek upholds that. I believe probably more that they went um, and either were on their way and and got caught in a predicament where they had to knock on someone's door, and and maybe that family either didn't trust them or, or didn't actually have room because people were migrating. Maybe someone was already staying with them and they had to stay in the, in, the, in the outer room, the guest room, or something I think is even more plausible is that they knew they were going on this trip, right? This was a scheduled thing. Wouldn't it have made sense if maybe Mary or Joseph had extended family that lived in the area and they stayed with them because Mary was pregnant? I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm just saying it, it, it makes sense. Now you say, why would family ever kick you out? They're, 
there's no room in the end. They had to have known they were coming. Well, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Maybe they just got caught in a situation where Mary was giving birth and they had to rush and they had family in the area. They had a, a breakdown, if you will, and they, they had to rush in and, and get help from family because that's what you do. What if upon coming into contact with the immediate family or the, the extended family, if they saw Mary for what the rest of the world saw her as, a pregnant little girl who claimed, claimed she was a virgin, and that meant they saw her as a liar and deceitful and someone who slept around before marriage and was carrying the child of someone who wasn't her husband, therefore judged her and would not allow her to sleep in the house and made her sleep in the guest room in the end. I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm saying that's plausible. Can you imagine if that is true, the alone feeling that Mary and Joseph would have had as Mary was giving birth to God in the flesh. You ever felt alone? You ever felt really alone, even when you felt like you were in the midst of God's plan? Have you ever just felt alone? My first Christmas as a believer, um, I didn't become a believer until I was almost 16, and, and uh, my first Christmas as a believer, I just want to let you know, I felt very, very alone. It was just my mother and I, and um, my mom was a non-believer. In fact, um, she kicked me out of the house when I became a believer. I lived outside of the house for three or four months and was able to finally move back in, and things didn't get easier when I came back in, and, and that first Christmas was very awkward. As I, for the first time in my life as a 16-year-old, celebrated the birth of Jesus because it meant the remission of my sins, you remember what it's like to have the joy of your salvation and be a brand new believer ready to charge hell with a water pistol? You remember that? Now, all of a sudden, go in a house where it's just you and your mom and no one to back you up, and your mom keeps telling you she doesn't want to hear you praise Jesus. I was alone. I felt like I was the only one in the world who could, who could understand what I was going through. It was tough. And I had Christian friends, but all, all of them came from Christian families. They had no idea. I, I felt utterly alone. I needed friends, and I needed help. I needed help. When my daughter, Zaylee, was born, um, my son, Javik, was four and a half, and he dealt with it really well at the hospital, and people told us he might have a tough time and to get him extra presents and things like that, and so people did that, and everyone was great, and we really watched after him and thought we did a great job as parents of making sure that he didn't feel alone or disgruntled, and he, and he didn't. Two and a half, three weeks, and he was wonderful, and we thought, man, we have really got it together, and everyone else that has ever parented is dumb. And... Uh, it's nice to be a, a new parent, isn't it? And uh, one day I'm standing in the kitchen and I look out the window and I see my little boy and he's just, he's slunched over on the porch. He's sitting down and you ever looked at your kid and just known they're heartbroken? I walked outside, he's four and a half. What's he have to be heartbroken about? He's not paying any bills, what in the world? And so I walk out there and I said, buddy, are you okay? How are you doing? And he says, I'll, I'll never forget it. He looked at me and he said, dad, Feel like there's no room for me in this house. I said, well, buddy, there's plenty of room. We love you, and you're my boy, and you're my firstborn, and you know, all these things. And, and uh, he said, uh, he goes, I hear what you're saying. Four and a half, all right? You're like, hey, listen. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, but I feel alone. You can be surrounded by people and feel alone, can't you? Would you do me a favor this morning? And I'm not, I'm not asking you if you feel alone right now. I'm saying if you ever in your life, um, those of you in the East Room, please raise your hand as well. If you ever in your life felt alone, just do me a favor and raise up your hand. And just raise it up high. Don't be ashamed. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And here's what I want you to do. Keep your hand up and just do me a favor. Don't look at individuals, but just look around and see all the hands up. You see, you see all the people with their hand up? Go ahead and put your hands down. I just want you to understand something, that that's the majority of us have felt at some point in our life alone, and, and that's a big deal. We need to know that this morning because as much as sometimes things are going well for us and we forget that there's others that are feeling alone, remember that there's been a point where you have felt alone and there will be a point where you do feel alone, and somewhere in the midst of that, there needs to be someone that comes alongside of you and reminds you that you're not so this morning, I want to very quickly talk to you about two types of alone, two types of ways that we can feel alone, be alone. Um, 
The, the first one being this, I think there's two ways that we as individuals can feel alone. Number one, we can feel separated from society, right? Um, when we feel alone, a lot of times it's because we feel like there's no one who understands what we personally are going through, or we feel like we're the only one struggling with something, or we feel like no one else can see our viewpoint. I have felt that way. You have felt that way. Can I, can I share something with you? There are people at North Road who feel that way. They feel alone. One of the things that we need to do sometimes is recognize that there's an issue and do our best to deal with it. And so can I just communicate something to, to North Road members and, and followers of Jesus this morning? If you're here this morning, one of the greatest things you can do in the life of your church as a whole is to spend less time on a Sunday morning communicating with friends and acquaintances that you have. Spend less time doing that because they're your friends. You can talk to them during the week, right? and spend more time on a Sunday morning ministering to those who you don't have a relationship with or who you see off by themselves. Because can I share something with you? They might not have anyone else. As the kid who accepted Jesus and then went to church all by himself for several years, can I just tell you, praise the Lord for those little ladies that came up and put their arm around me and talked to me when no one else would. I don't know where I'd be without them. Praise the Lord for those older men that came and invested in my life and asked me if I'd like to go hunting or fishing with them. Because little did they know they didn't know me. I didn't even have a father figure. I needed that. Praise the Lord for people who understood that people don't need to feel alone. And in the body of Christ, there is no excuse for people feeling alone. Sometimes we're separated from society and that's what makes us feel alone. The other way sometimes that we can feel alone is that we're separated from God. We're separated from God. And, and um, in Genesis chapter 3, I'll show you very quickly, there's a time even when Adam and Eve are separated from God. Um, in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, um, here's what happens. Adam and Eve have, have Adam's been created, and, and God saw it was not good for Adam to be alone, and he created Eve for him. And then shortly thereafter, they eat of the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when they did so, they felt guilt and shame because they rebelled against God. First time they've ever felt it before. First time they've ever felt sin. And they're shamed and they hide and they try and be alone. And it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And here's what God said. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat of? Who told you that you were naked? And saying this, God is simply saying this, who told you that you needed to be covered and hide who you truly are? Who told you that there was something wrong with you? Why are you hiding from me? Why are you trying to be alone? Of course, God knew all the answers to these questions he was asking, right? Sometimes it's in the asking of the question that the truth is revealed to us. And sometimes we need to ask ourselves this question, why do I feel so alone? Or number two, we need to ask ourselves, why do other people feel so alone? Sometimes we feel alone because we're separated from society. Sometimes we feel alone because we're separated from God. Here's the kicker though. As if we are followers of Christ, if we feel separated from God, I just want you to understand one thing. It's, it's by our own doing, right? It's not because God has somehow forsaken us and left us because he promises us he won't do that. In fact, he says in James chapter 4, verse 8, that if we will draw near to him, that he will draw near to us. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So watch what happens. He's right here. I'm a follower of Jesus, and, my, and, and, and one of my main goals is to glorify the Lord, to have a relationship with him through Jesus. And so here I am. And sometimes I feel really close, and sometimes I feel really far. But watch what happens. When I feel really close, who moves? I do. And when I feel really far, who moves? I do. God didn't move. We moved. Sometimes we truly want to walk with Jesus and have a great relationship with the Lord. And sometimes we want to do our own thing, don't we? And we're over here. Well, I've got some good news for you. Whether you feel separated from society or separated from God, there is an answer found not only in the pages of Scripture, but inside a body of believers inside the church. Let's deal with being separated from God first. If you feel separated from God and you are a follower of Christ, the answer is in the demonstration I just gave you. It is run back to God. Say no to sin and self and run back to the Lord. And you say, well, that sounds easy, but it's hard. Yes, it is. 
It's hard. It is so hard for me to deny myself and say no to coal in order to say yes to Jesus. You ever been there? Sometimes you got to say no to you to say yes to Jesus. Sometimes part of you has to die so that he can live. And if you feel separated from God, I've got great news for you. If you're a believer, it simply takes repentance, confession to the Lord, and coming back. If you're a non-believer, well, then the only way that you can have relationship with God is ultimately through Jesus, right? You can't, you can't do enough good works to take care of the sin in your life. That's not how it works. It's not, a, it's not a good and bad scale. Good works don't get rid of sin. Jesus gets rid of sin, amen? And, and, and because Jesus is the only way to get rid of sin, then there has to come a point where you're in, in my life where we realize that we've rebelled against God and we need forgiveness for our sin, I just want to share a few scriptures with you to tell you the truth about salvation. In John 1, 12, But to all who received him, meaning Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who love him. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a brand new creation. All the old things have passed and all things are made brand new. And maybe this Christmas season, the reason you're feeling alone is because you don't have a relationship with God because you're trying to do it on your own. And maybe the thing you need to do is to surrender and to say no to yourself and yes to Jesus. And in doing so, asking Christ to take away your sin and make you a brand new person. And guess what? If you ever thought you got a good present for Christmas, can I just tell you, receiving salvation from Jesus Christ trumps them all. Amen? Amen? It's a big deal. Maybe that's what you need to do, but maybe you're here and you would say, Cole, I feel separated from society. I feel separated from my church feel like I'm on, on an island all alone. That's tough. Church, if you consider yourself a part of the church, not, not just North Road, but the church, the body of believers, I, I, I just, for a moment, just listen to me here. I just want to say this because we're family, and family can talk to each other differently. Somewhere along the way, we have made church into something that it was never intended to be. I think Northwood is a great church, and I've heard great things about you even last night at the hotel. I think you guys are doing a great job of loving people, especially the other churches you're calling unlovable. Praise God for that. Amen? That's a big deal. But church, somewhere along the way, we have at times turned the church into a social club and not a hospital. Meaning this, somewhere along the way, we thought that church was for our comfort and our relationship necessarily and not us investing in other people. And I'm not saying this to shame anyone or make anyone feel bad. I I'm saying this because I also am guilty of this many times. What I mean is this. There's got to come a point where we realize a couple things. Number one, if you are a part of the church and you feel alone, you need to tell someone that you feel alone. It is really hard for individuals to help you if you're not asking for help. You know what happened when the guy got his tongue stuck on the pole? He at least screamed, help me, come back, come back. It's not his fault that everyone punked out and left, right? It's their fault for leaving. But doggone it, at least he asked for help. And I think sometimes we don't take the time to ask for help. So I'm just going to encourage you, if that's you, you need to ask someone for help. And I'm going to tell you how to do that here in just a, in a moment or so. But church, listen to me. I think a lot of times that there are people with their tongue stuck to the pole, all alone, out there. And, and, and I just think sometimes the Holy Spirit reveals those people to us. We even, 
we know, we have acknowledgement that we should invest in them, but it's so much easier to go back to class, right? It's so much easier for us to run back to life and do what is easy and hang out with the friends that we know and not get involved in their mess and all of those things. And I just want to let you know something. One of the greatest things about the church is that Jesus Christ never intended for us to do life as believers alone. I used to have this student in my youth ministry that said, when I grow up, I'm going to be like a hermit. I'm going to go to Alaska and buy this chunk of land and live all alone and blah, blah, blah. And he said, I loved it. And I said, listen to me, you were never created to do life alone. You were never created for that. You are created for relationship. Even if you're extremely introverted, you are created for relationship. It's how you are designed and you need people even if you don't think you need them. Because guess what happens when you don't have people in accountability? You do things that are wrong. You act in ways that are wrong. Your heart becomes hard. You kind of go off the grid, don't you? Here's the cool thing about it. Just as in... in what is it, in Luke 10? Is that right? I don't even remember. Yeah, in Luke 10, Jesus sends his disciples out to share the gospel two by two. And why does he do that? Because he knows if they're alone, they won't accomplish the task. If they have to have someone else with them, they have to do life together because they'll get scared, they'll get weak, they'll get frail, they'll run away, they'll, they'll, they'll do all of these things. So he sends them out two by two and says, look, do it together. Can I ask you something? If you feel alone, who are you asking for help to do life with? And listen to me, if you are a part of the church, who are you intentionally ministering to that you think no one else is? A lot of you are going to get done with church and you're going to go home and you're going to eat lunch and you're not going to ask anyone to go with you. And you're going to say, oh, we don't have enough food, but I know we're fat Americans, right? We got enough food, right? You can figure something out. I said we, don't get mad. Folks, sometimes we just need to call a spade a spade and deal with it, right? There is no excuse for the body of Christ being alone. There's no excuse. And so here's how I want to challenge you this morning. Why don't you make Christmas great this year and do a few things for me? If you're not a believer, ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, to take away your sin, to make you a brand new person and end that point of being alone and have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Number two, if you are a member of the body of Christ and you feel alone, here's what I want you to do. Sometime today or this week, I want you to contact a staff member here, Matt or Sean, somebody, and say, I feel alone. You can call them and literally, I feel alone. And they'll help you. I promise. Tell a trusted person in the church, I feel alone. Ask for help. Number three, church folks, don't wait for people to ask for help, right? Because that's what we're doing. We want someone to scream out because their tongue's on the pole, but really, we just need to run up and love somebody, right? We need to run up and get involved in their mess. Even if they didn't ask us to, that's okay. You don't need to be annoying about it, but love them, befriend them, build a relationship with them, spend time with them. What would the church look like if this Christmas season so many people didn't feel alone. Just want you to think about how it would encourage and equip us to go out into the world that we live during a time that celebrates a whole season that focuses on the birth of Jesus. And maybe we'd start telling other people about the birth and love of Jesus. Because you know when it's not awkward? Christmas, right? And doing so first and foremost because we realize that you can't do life alone and that you need help. Would you pray with me this morning? Could we do that? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's just pray. Uh, the band will come up. Lord, we, uh, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here. And Lord, we ask right now that you um, would speak to our hearts. Father, if we're here and we need help and we feel alone, Lord, we pray that you would um, give us the opportunity to... Father, you'd give us the opportunity simply to be able to ask for help. And Lord, maybe we're here this morning and, and uh, we don't feel alone right now, but we know there's others that are. Lord, I, I pray that you would compel us to get involved in their lives. And so uh, this morning, before we close, I just want to ask you a question right there where you're seated with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here this morning and during this season, you just feel alone. No one's looking around. No one's looking at you. I, just so I can pray for you. If that's you this morning, would you just raise up your hand and by doing so just say, I, I feel alone. If that's you, just go ahead and raise your hand. No one's going to call you out. I just, I just want to pray over you. If that's you, just raise them up high. I see your hands. Anybody else? 
Uh, Father, I pray right now for these individuals that you would give them relationship, Father, that you would allow them to know that they're not alone, that in a way that they don't only they understand that you would show them how much they're loved, Father, that they would feel surrounded by your love. Thank you so much that we're never alone, that you never leave us, you never forsake us. Father, we thank you that you love us so much. And Lord, I pray that you would bring someone into their life that walks through this stage with them. Go ahead and put your hands back down. If you're here this morning and, and you would say, I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Jesus. And this morning I realized that, man, I, I need to be taking a, a greater step towards investing in other people and making sure that people aren't going through life alone. And this morning, just between me and God, I, I want to commit to him that I'll be more available to him to do that, that I'll spend more time doing that and less time focusing on my own needs, my own self. If that's you this morning, just right there where you're seated no one looking around, just raise up your hand. And by doing so, I say, I commit to that. Several people, anybody else? I just want to pray for you as well. Uh, Father, first and foremost, may their tribe increase. Lord, may you uh, continue to raise up men and women of faith who are willing to say no to themselves so that they can say yes to you. Father, and I pray right now that you would continue to make North Road a church that is full of people who so desperately are following after you that they are willing to get involved in the mess of other people so that they don't go through life or even through a day alone. Father, I pray for this body that you might call them to do whatever you want to call them to do and you'll receive all the glory. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.